This is KBLA Talk 1580, where hate loses and love wins. And we stay winning. I certainly hope and pray that love continues to win uh, for the family of Andrew Joseph III. We are tracking this trial closely. Uh, we heard earlier um, from one of the organizers on the ground there with Black Lives Matter, Tabitha Jones Jolivet, now checking with, in with us again. Um, on his way in and out of the courtroom is uh, independent reporter with the Los Angeles Progressive and uh, The Conversation Live, James Farr. Good morning, James. Good morning, Dominic. How are you? I'm blessed. Uh, how are you doing? What's new? Um, how, how are things going? I, uh, Tabitha was telling me the courtroom's been pretty full. That's more than an ocean, considering, Housekeeping. as you uh, so clearly described Hello? yesterday, a giant. Uh, uh, room. Uh, absolutely. The courtroom. Hello? Uh, day two, there were more people there. Today, there are, uh, are expected to be even more uh, supporters with uh, Black Lives Matter grassroots, local organizations, and uh, friends and family of the, uh, the Josephs. So, Hola. Um, it's, it's, it's a somber space. You know, it's, the, the court is very surreal. I mean, when you're hearing the testimony from witnesses, you're hearing the attorneys, and then again yesterday, uh, uh, Sister Deanna just so eloquently and gracefully uh, sat there as she was prodded and poked, and her whole entire life was examined. And that, I just can't imagine Hola. having to do that as a parent. Yeah, it sounds pretty um, horrible. I know you're writing a series of articles about this case um, for the LA Progressive and, and for other work. As part of that, you spent some time with um, with Andrew Joseph III's dad. Hello. Yes. Yes. Uh, yesterday, he came out of court in pretty good spirits. Um, you know, he's he's a jovial guy as as he is by nature, right? And so. He came out of the court, he led, he has this kind of chant that he does, uh, you know, when, when the families are in community, but he said, brother, let's go take a drive, and we took an hour drive, and he just, you know, I think he needed to clear his head, he wanted to kind of go down some memories, he showed me the high school that his son had worked so hard to get accepted to, and was preparing the next day for his confirmation. Um, we saw, I got a chance to really see their connection to the community, where they do their food pantry. I saw the, the, the chapel where the young Andrew was eulogized. Um, just a myriad of things within the community that, that was very grounded. But he, he thinks about his son every day. It's obvious. Yeah, yeah he's, he's, he's really um, so passionate about, oh, I mean, as, as a father would be, but he's just a passionate individual from what I've seen. Um, Talk to me about, you You said um, Mark Clark, who is on the stand, um, appeared to contradict himself. What do you mean by that? What I mean by that, uh, as a part of his deposition, he uh, had indicated that he had transported the young Andrew um, to a well-lit area. And we saw in court yesterday through photos and a series of other evidence that was presented and even other testimony that he essentially dropped him off in a dark place, he and uh, the other young men. And so we're seeing that the, the sheriff's department, again, as I said yesterday, they're digging in. They're blaming Andrew uh, III for this entire incident. Right. Um, it's an interesting uh, strategy, blaming a child for um, you dropping him off in the middle of nowhere in the dark without calling his parents. But I mean, in Florida, you never know. In Florida, George Zimmerman gets off. So um, maybe they're banking on that all white jury to deliver them uh, the, the verdict they're looking for in spite of what, to me, to any mom would seem very, a very shady defense. Yeah, I mean, well, the defense is doing what they're supposed to, which right. is, is to deflect and, and, and place blame other than on the officer. Um, you know, you're right, this is Florida, and we've seen stranger things, right? And, and understanding that they took this child, there's no question about that, right? And to expect uh, a child to make decisions that an adult would make is just 
developmentally not correct. Uh, it's not fair to that child. Um, he didn't place himself there. And we've all been 14, and we have, I have a 14 year old. Sometimes they don't make the best decisions because they're afraid, right? Well, and, and the so teenage brain. I mean, and, and afraid is a great point, uh, James Farr, because if your child, uh, my child, who's a little older than that, doesn't make decisions on a regular day, imagine after being detained by the police, uh, interrogated by the police, held in a car and driven somewhere where you don't know where you are. Uh, they're going to be beyond scared and they're going to be traumatized at that point. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's reptilian brain at that point, you know, fight, fly, to freeze. And we, no one can blame uh, the young Andrew for what happened. Right. I mean, he was on a deserted, not a deserted, but a very busy interstate. And we learned that he traversed the interstate twice. They were literally lost in trying to figure out how to get back. And now it seems as though the defense is saying that the person who told them to go back around uh, may not have even been a police officer. So I, I, I assume there's going to be enough that's going to appear from out of nowhere that either did tell them or didn't tell them, but none of the ones that are currently in question are, are saying that they told him that he needed to go around. And to be clear, um, Mark Clark is one of the deputies uh, who is who is um, involved in taking Andrew Joseph III. Not all of them will even face this trial because of qualified immunity, correct? Correct. What's interesting, he's the only one that hasn't been granted qualified immunity. The other two officers have been granted uh, qualified immunity. However, if this case is appealed, everything resets and those other officers would also have to try to uh, get qualified immunity again. So it's, it's going to be an interesting, this is just the first, uh, this is day three, there's another six or seven day schedule of hearings. Uh, the defense has not taken uh, uh, their position as of yet, you know, and so cross-examination. So next week should be pretty telling. Yeah, well, this week is already pretty telling. Um, you, you know, you mentioned the role of the black media here. Can you just give me, uh, because, you know, I notice it's not really being covered. It's not covered on CNN. It's not covered on MSNBC. We talked about that yesterday. Uh, talk to me about the black media and the coverage of Andrew Joseph III. It's just so important that if we're not here to tell these stories, to, to sit and bear witness, um, we're only left with what mainstream narratives are. And if you heard the testimony yesterday, and I've read the local and watched some of the local news channels here just to see how they're reporting out on it, still lost is that the Joseph family, if I had my black utopia community, they're my neighbors. Right, that they are the people who I want to live next door to, and so you just don't get that. And I, I realized yesterday, after hearing Sister Deanna's testimony, her story, sadly she's been preparing for this her entire life, and I, by that I mean just her grace, her elegance, and I don't know many, if any, that could hold it together while they're examining their entire life and the decisions they made with their child. It's just, it's unconscionable what's happening here and what these families have to go through on the stand, if they're lucky to get on the stand. James Farr, so appreciate your uh, checking in with us, giving us your reporter's eye. How, where can we find the stories you're writing about uh, this and, and how can we follow you? Uh, James Farr Live at, on Twitter, over at the LA Progressive, hit that authors tab and you'll find uh, James Farr as an author, a simple Google. All right, at the LA Progressive, uh, is that a dot .com or a dot .org? Dot .com. The LA, I, you know, I get, I get it in my inbox, so I don't have to go on the website. LAProgressive.com. James Farr, appreciate you, appreciate the work that you are doing, and I uh, look forward to talking with you in the days ahead, the week ahead. Absolutely. Thank you, Dominic. Have a good day. And you as well. Not too late to call me if you want. 800-920-15.